Well, let me uh, uh, take uh, a moment uh, to thank Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, for taking time out of an extremely busy schedule uh, to uh, offer a few thoughts and to welcome you here to, uh, to our campus. Uh, Eric hardly needs an introduction, but I can tell you that uh, he has a remarkable history of involvement in technology uh, and its use. Uh, he was the CTO at Sun Microsystems for some years, became the uh, CEO of Novell, where uh, I'm sure he engaged in an incredible battle between the Internet world and the IPX world that, was, uh, uh, that split the company in many respects. Uh, and then had the uh, good fortune or good sense or both uh, to uh, come to Google to, uh, to lead this company for uh, the last uh, eight or nine years. Uh, he has been a spokesperson for uh, the value of technology and its impact on our society, on our economy and our ability to utilize information. And if there's any person who personalizes, uh, personifies uh, our motto, which you heard earlier today, which is organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful, it's Eric, who somehow manages to keep that fixed in his mind uh, while he's trying to manage this burgeoning enterprise that started with two people 10 years ago and now numbers over 20,000. Uh, as you probably are deeply aware, Eric is also uh, involved uh, heavily in advising not only the U.S. government but other governments as they struggle to uh, absorb the impact of technolo technological change. So, uh, Eric, I'm not going to take up any more of your air time. Let me thank you uh, profusely for joining us this afternoon oh, well, and you. turn the microphone over to you. Well, thank you, Matt. Yeah. Oh, I have a picture of Vint and me. Photo op. Yeah. That's right. The, uh, when I was a young executive at Sun, I was asked, who did I most admire in the entire world? And that person is Vint Cerf. And if you think I'm making that up, Sun was foolish enough to actually make a huge poster with my picture stating this with his image, which they <laughs> gave us as a memento. So uh, Vint, in my mind, represents the very best of humanity, a uh, kind of selfless dedication to a cause that I think all of us have worked hard to be able to do for such a long time. There are other people in the room who I feel are perhaps not as well known, but have had the same principle that Vint has articulated so well over his over his long life. And I, it's clear to me that the internet is unique because of the people who founded it and ran it, and largely established the set of principles that I want to talk about for a few minutes. So first, my goal here is to welcome you guys to to Google. I think most of you who've been here before and the Google employees, you know where you are. Uh, but but from our perspective. Uh, it's obvious that the Internet is essentially everything to us. Uh, when I think about my career and the things that I've been able to do, uh, they've all fundamentally started from the concept of DARPA, the concept of TCPIP, uh, the kinds of things that you could do with openness in my early career with Unix and Unix's integration with TCPIP and so forth and so on, and subsequent activities. And what I like about it is it's all the same theme. It's the same of openness, of growth, and of sort of creating new things. And if you think about what we care about right now at Google, the first and most important thing, and I don't mean this to sound defensive, is we care that it stays this way. And I want to come back to some of the threats to this. Let's start with some of the opportunities. Uh, it's clear that the, that the Moore's Law revolution will continue, in particular as applied to fiber optics and routers and so forth. It's not slowing down. It may slow down in 10 to 15 years, but we've got a fair amount ahead of us. Some people in the room are involved in some of the amazing things going on at the hardware and routing level, uh, which we think absolutely makes sense. The, sort of the ISO stack and all those kinds of things, all those things invented a long time ago still work. It's nice to see the things that you learn in graduate school you still don't need to learn something new. It's still the same principles work. And it's nice to see it actually get to where it, where it can be. We have in front of us 
huge networks of CPUs, disk drives, complex routers, simple switches, and so forth that combine into a new model, which we generally call cloud computing. You all understand what this is, but think of it as web computing applied to the historic model. The story that I like to, to talk about is um, in the 1980s, Gardner Group invented um, three-tier computing. When you have a marketing consultancy inventing a computer architecture, you know you have a problem. And the reason they did that is that nobody could get anything to work because the networks weren't open, the standards weren't set, and so forth. And it took us a very long time to get to the point where the modern and open principles of the internet that we also celebrate are now capable of use in applications platforms, integration, and so forth and so on. So when I, when I sit down and I look at it and I go back in my own history and see the narrative, I see this constant progression of growth at each and every level. The, the, the things that we need to take advantage of now are the enormous platform that has been created. So let's define the platform. Let's start with a billion plus people. God knows how many computers. You all are familiar. You saw some of the numbers this morning. Uh, and every one of those is an opportunity for better accuracy, better service, better application. What's interesting to me is that we're at another, if you will, tipping or influence point because the internet is no longer something which was sort of our toy space. It's interesting, fun, people got uh, went public on it and so forth and so on. It's now become essential and it's sufficiently essential that it's now threatening the very fabric of certain industries. And the most obvious example has to do with traditional telephony and traditional um, uh, radio and frequency management. The distinction between radio and television is obviously artificial if you think about it in the context of fiber optics and TCP IP. Right? Why is this all not one set of information expressed in different ways? It's obvious if you think about it that way, and yet we have 50 years of regulatory business structure and so forth around that. Uh, the whole principle of openness and the whole notion of no constraints. If you think about the internet, the internet is really about no scarcity. Well, almost all businesses, certainly in the media industries, are based on scarcity. They have windows and restrictions and rules and so forth and so on. And yet consumers, those pesky, obnoxious consumers, actually just want what they want when they want it. And this is causing a huge identity crisis for people who basically ran their businesses without their end user as their principal. So, and Google is by, by no means perfect here, but our basic objective is to start from the premise of what is in the best interest of the consumer. And I can tell you that in my experience talking to consumers is they want everything, they want it now, they want it right, and they want it perfect. Okay? Seems pretty straightforward. So why don't we just deliver on that? Actually, actually, with actually with they want us to pay you at this point. But but you see my point. It's a very very different model. So go through the industries that have been affected by this, and you begin to understand the game that we're now playing is no longer just entertaining. It's really very very serious. Uh, businesses that are built around scarcity are going to fight openness, and they're going to do it in many many different ways. Businesses that depend on um, scarcity, in particular licensing, don't particularly like the free notion that, that has ended up be, being so popular on the internet. And we face many, many threats, but I suspect the biggest threats have to do with trying to close off the openness and the end-to-end -end principles that have built the internet so strongly and so well. Uh, uh, the, the, the ones I'm worried about have to do with governments, because they're, because, you know, it's a shock. I, I used to do this thing when I was at Sun. I have a surprise for you. I go, what? There's a criminal on the internet. And I'd go, and they go, like, how do you know? I said, because there's criminals not on the internet. Okay. And if I knew who they were, I'd have them arrested. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't know who they are because they haven't committed a crime yet. Right. And this seems obvious today, but it was a new concept 10 years ago. So if you build something which touches all of society, you have to deal with that fact. And the, so the fact of the matter is that b because of one reason or another, people are using these things as excuses to try to put in very, very significant changes into the way we might operate in the future. And that's something that we need to think about. 
The best solution would be to come up with a technological solution which would do, quote, the right thing, but remain the openness, retain the openness. The worst thing is to essentially have as a result large islands of closed information, which would be a significant step back. So from a Google perspective, what we care about is we care about scalability, we care about access, and we care about transparency. My assertion to you is that if you can build networks that are roughly open, transparent, and scalable, where rough, and again, there are always going to be edge conditions, but that basically where the next set of innovators can build the next category of applications, you can talk about that later this afternoon, but as long as that's true, we're going to be just fine. Because ultimately, I'm an optimist about the way people behave in society. I'm one of these people who believes that the, the overall human condition is a positive one, that people really do want the world to be a better place, and that the remarkable achievement that all of you helped build, Vint, of course, but many others, um, that that will continue, and that there's no particular reason for us to think other than very, be very optimistic that we can overcome the challenges, whether it's a... A, a, a politician who doesn't understand something because we can talk to them or a government that's not elected that behaves badly and we have a set of those at any given time. Uh, we, but we can overcome these with uh, both talking, fighting, and better technology. So then that was sort of my, my opening comment. Thank you. Did thank you, did you want... Oh, thank you. Yeah, did... did, did I, I, I'm, I'm your, you're my host, so yeah, whatever well, you want. And if this is a golden opportunity, folks. Uh, yes. so go, go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Let's get microphones. That's fine. Okay. I saw him. You didn't say the S word, uh, security. Sun. <laughs> so <laughs> what's your... <laughs> The concept of sun being bought by Oracle is still something that I'm working through in my own mind. No, but, so it's so, just so, so for... Uh, S as in security. So, what um, what would be your answer to how, um, given the other three parameters, um, you would like to see that approached? What are the other three parameters? The ones that uh, I mean, Openness, the ones that I mean. innovation, and yada yada yada. So, I still believe public key crypto systems are the right answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I believe this 20 years ago, and they still are not in widespread use except for certain kind of key, key uses. I, I don't understand why we have been so slow at using the technology that has existed for so long. You don't like the, the uh, again, PGP, you name it. Um, and we've accepted in society that we have routine locks on houses, which can be broken by a sophisticated locksmith, but they provide enough thing. I, I, I do not understand why, attitudinally, we haven't addressed that coherently in TCP IP uh, and in the systems above it. It seems obvious to me that uh, the kind of simple, straightforward encryption chips or circuits could be reasonably ubiquitous that would provide enough security against normal interlopers. I'm not talking about the sophisticated attacks. Uh, and I think my, my guess is the problem is we have the brilliant security people who basically try to solve the problem definitively, and then we have the other people who don't understand what they're talking about, and that the, mid, the middle of that, which is a routine and common, easygoing security that worked against teenagers who weren't too smart, right, that that would be a huge improvement. Again, I'm not talking about very sophisticated attacks by very sophisticated professionals, which I think will require a different mechanism with. Eric, may I try to answer the question? Yeah, of course. I think it's more a capital development problem than anything else. Um, if you field a key management infrastructure, you have a lot of upfront costs and a lot of downstream rewards. And if you look at the way the central facility at NSA works, it's capitalized entirely differently. That's but, one but, key but, aspect but, but, of it. But, but the other is our problem is much harder because diversity of authority is the bane of security. DOD is very large, but the fact that it's so centralized makes, makes security much easier for them, mm -hmm. even though they think it's more difficult right. because they demand very high standards. And, and I'm also one of these people who believes that security is achieved by having multiple stages. So again, I, my, my position on security is relatively simple layers of systems are probably good enough for most things. 
Um, yeah, so Craig Partridge, hi. Hi, Craig. Um, so I had a completely different question, which is, you know, Google is now running some of the world's largest compute farms. I would hope it's the largest. Well, it may be the largest, but <laughs> I was just, you know. You're being um, polite. You're being your usual polite self. Right. Um, one of the things that seems to be going on, if you track both the industrial literature and some of the research literature, is that those are becoming their own network ecosystems. Yes. That they are running their own specialized network protocols that they are um, – and, and one of the interesting things is they seem to be re rediscovering certain errors that we made 15 years ago. And the question yes. is, how do you see that evolution progressing? In some sense, that's sort of the set of private internets that are sort of hidden away, yet this they're is, a huge part of the economic driver but This now. is why my job is so easy. We're redoing everything we did 10 or 15 years ago just at a different scale. But you have all the same problems, latency, reliability, and so forth. It's just you know three orders of magnitude faster. And in our case, to some degree, cloud computing is a return to mainframe computing. So you have all the issues of management, revocation, who, you know, how do you deal with users, how do you deal with billing, all those kinds of things. Uh, I think from our perspective, we benefit from the fact that the PC industry is standardized on very fast e Ethernet chips, basically. And so you should think of our architecture as PCs with Ethernet chips with very, very fast protocol drivers. So we will... For example, use the fact that TCPIP has windows in it and things like that in, in, in clever ways architecturally. I don't think you should generalize from Google's experience to everybody else. Because our, our data needs are so large, we ultimately find ourselves building specialized solutions. But that doesn't follow that everyone else has to do the same thing. Uh, literally, uh, the amounts of data that we move around are so much larger than everybody else's. Well, well, yes, but there's this rumor running around, I don't know if it's true or not, that, that half of Cisco's high-end routers are now being sold into data centers. I'm sure that's for, true. For large quant yeah, that I'm are sure managing large quantities of data. They may not be a Google size, but I'm yeah. just saying, I'm if you sure look at that true. as an ecosystem, you're starting to say that's a pretty big yeah. financial and intellectual ecosystem potential. But, but Cisco is very good at routers. Right. Right? So they're probably figuring out all the, all the, subtle, the subtle issues. The, the only fundamental difference within a data center is that you have better control over, over the speed of light because you understand your, your physical locality. You have all the other issues. Uh, but I've argued for a long time that, you know, that basically co computation speed is ultimately constrained by speed of light. We had this funny story where we were building a data center, and we were having this debate as to whether it had to be one story, two stories, or three stories based on the speed of light to the central hub. And I thought, God, this is where we have gotten. And by the way, the answer turns out to be that the topology that was being used it's highly proprietary, was suitable for a one-story design. It's a one -story. Go ahead. Uh, Howard, uh, yes, hi. Playing security a little bit. Uh, you mentioned cloud computing again. Microphone Sorry. Microphone. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned you brought up cloud computing, which is which really a good point, particularly in the context of rebuilding things that we may not have done right 10, 15 years ago. There was a big debate at a, at RSA a couple of weeks ago about cloud computing and and the fact that security is not being built into it as we're starting to do the architecture for security, or excuse me, for cloud computing. Can you comment on, on where your perspective is on that? Is it indeed a priority to say we're going to build, build the PKI into cloud computing, we're going to do all the other things we need to be doing on, out the, the gate? I don't know enough of the answer to, to give you a precise technical answer. Uh, cloud computing, as we express it, of course, everyone, because it's now a buzzword in marketing, everyone has now defined it in their own terms. We define it as essentially HTML5 web, web browser applications with a back-end server that uses uh, TCP IP as in, and RPCs in the obvious way. Uh, so the answer to your question depends on where you think security should lie. Do you think it should be at the application layer, or do you think it should be at some middleware layer below that the applications can use? Um, I think it's too early to really know. It's very strategic for us that people build, think of them as AJAX applications, AJAX++, you know, with all of the extensions and so forth that are being pre prevented, pre presented, because that displaces the traditional PC uh, dedicated client architecture. It's much more flexible in all the ways that you know the data is in the right places and so forth. So I, 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 don't, know how, I don't know how security will play out. I'm not aware within Google of a lot of activity at the applications level in security because the, the kinds of questions you're asked are still relatively early. So and we, maybe we should fix that. Yeah. Steve? Yeah. No, let's, let's ask Steve have the last question. Last question. 
Thank you very much. Steve Carter. Yeah, uh, you're heavily involved, besides of Google, with uh, representing Silicon Valley to Washington sure. and uh, providing advice. Can you say something about the dynamics of that, Where what's been active and, and uh, where the access is, what the dialogue looks like? Uh, well, a couple of things. First, I, I, I think people here in the room know that I was a significant supporter of President Obama as a candidate, so I should disclose that right up front. Uh, because I felt that this was a, a candidate for president who actually understood technology and believed in science, uh, which to me was revolutionary. Uh, and <laughs> Right? So that's like a big deal. So far, President Obama has done all of the things that a person who is not a scientist but who believes in science would have done. Within his first week, he very quickly and carefully reversed anti-science policies that existed in the previous administration in the stimulus package, there was an increase in, in science funding and technology funding that was extremely significant. So, for example, NSF bu budget was doubled. The NIH budgets were, were doubled as well. And these are going to, to high-quality organizations. Then, from my perspective, the recession hit. And I think the government has been dealing with the banks and, and all the other issues everybody knows. And so the science and technology agenda has largely been a secondary thing. And I think they'll get back to that. If you look at the president's advisors on science, uh, they're all top-notch, uh, in particular John Holgren, all that, that sort of whole team. So there's hope that, that the institution of government will now have a set of places where they can actually get some accurate, accurate and cor techn technically correct advice before they make whatever political decisions they're going to make. Uh, so I think it's a, in that sense, it's a new dawn. It's not obvious that it follows that all the policy prescriptions are the same as what you or I would want. In other words, the fact that there's accuracy does not necessarily mean that they'll choose to do the right things. So for example, with banking, uh, the obvious solution in banking is transparency, because all the computers knew what the risk profiles were, but somehow the government hasn't figured out a way to suck all that information out of the banks and publish the, the nature of risks, and so they have these uh, manual processes and so forth around banking tests. So I think one of the things that we could do as a, as a group is, going back to this transparency thing, is to tell the government that why don't you make what you're doing more transparent? So for example, why don't you make all your hearings uh, webcast? It's trivial. Why don't, you have all the oper uh, op why don't you have all the groups within the government have the equivalent of YouTube channels and Facebook pages and that kind of stuff? I think that's coming. But it's not natural to the government. And in many ways, it's worth saying to the, that about any government, independent of the political thing, is governments are not typically in favor of transparency because it, it causes the bureaucracy the opportunity to be embarrassed. And so it takes an, it takes an act of the president, an act of Senate or, or Congress to force that. And we need to give them the examples. So televise all the information, publish all the data, make it available, and I think we'll get a better we'll get a better functioning government. We'll also be able to have a better sense of checks and balances by citizens who care a lot about things. So with that, I think Vint really does have the hook. So thank you. Aaron. So uh, thank you very much again, Eric. Uh, one thing I wanted to emphasize uh, is a comment that was made to me in 1994 by George Soros. Uh, he was addressing uh, a meeting of the Internet Society. It was an INET meeting in 1994 uh, in Prague. And Soros said, remember, he came from a communist-dominated country. He lived in a place where freedom didn't exist. And he made the observation about the Internet that just because it's been free up until now and open does not mean it will stay that way. And I thought it's very important to remind you of that because I think he's right. And that's a lead in uh, into the next session, which is all about security.